So I would have, I would have just probably told myself before accepting the position, like, go look for a startup. You don't need money that quickly. Um, I know you're in debt. You need to get out of it for sure, but, you know, maybe choose a middle ground where things are moving faster and the team is smaller and you can make more of an impact than, um, big corporate bureaucracy. But part of the reason I don't regret it now is I've learned that about myself is I don't want to work for big tech companies anymore. <laughs> so I'll never make the same mistake twice. Welcome to the Quit Work Podcast, 15 minute conversations with people who have quit their job and gone their own way. I'm uh, Mark and every week I talk to someone who has made the bold step of quitting to start to live their true life. The idea is to inspire you to live your true life, whatever that might mean to you. So today I am talking to Bart Hofkin, who quit a tech job with all of the benefits to go live on the road for six months. Bart, welcome to the Quit Work Podcast. Thanks for having me, Mark. So, um, so tell us a little bit about that cushy uh, tech job that you quit. Yeah, sure. So I was working for a tech company, um, kind of intro job out of college, uh, big tech company, 10,000 people, corporate campus, uh, themes kind of like Disneyland is what people would describe it as. There was a burger place in the castle next to my office and I was right next to the moving portraits in the coffee shop and the Harry Potter theme. You know, a lot of people would come and visit. My parents were so impressed. Oh, I've never seen corporate America look like this before. Glamorous on the outside, but on the inside, just the work was monotonous, boring, bureaucratic, um, same old stuff, uh, trying to move up in a corporate hierarchy and listening to other people is just not something that I was really interested in doing. So tell me what it was like to live in Disneyland. I mean, I know it wasn't literally Disneyland, but wasn't that a <laughs> bit weird? Most of the time I, you didn't even notice. I was just buried in my laptop all day working on things. For the most part, you get used to it. You know, there's the term hedonic adaptation <laughs> that just kept ringing in my mind every time I would walk down the hallway with the wizards and I would <laughs> like everybody I would come as a guest would be like, wow, look at these wizard photos. They're like moving and they're glowing and stuff. I'm like, oh, yeah, I kind of got used to that. It's not a, not a big deal anymore. So despite all the perks, it sounds like you were kind of a little bit miserable. So tell me a little bit more about why that was. Yeah, I mean, I have always kind of felt that I wanted to do my own thing, start a business or, you know, live nomadically or join a startup, something that moves fast and helps me grow and learn a lot. And at first, when I got the job, I was excited. I was independent kind of for the first time in my life. I went from living with my parents to living in college and college is, you know, that kind of middle ground. Um, but when I moved into the apartment on my own, had a single bed, had just me and my cat, uh, a full-time job and income uh, living in a, uh, sort of independent way was exciting for a while. And then I was doing the training that was, um, you know, sort of competitive. If you get it done quick enough, you get a raise. And I did the six month training in just over three months. So I was like, really go getter about it. Um, and then when I got assigned to customers up until the moment I left, it was more or less the same thing on a daily basis. And a lot of the things I didn't like, which was I had a boss, even though they said, we don't have bosses here, we have team leads. And I had to answer to him. And if he felt I wasn't right for an opportunity, then he was the gatekeeper and yeah. nothing I could say would necessarily convince him. And it was like, oh, you got feedback from like four months ago that you didn't do this quite right. And I'm like, well, I kind of want to grow and I want to learn and I want to do new and exciting things. You have to sort of take a chance with me if that's going to happen. And maybe it's just because of the particular boss I had, or maybe it's because of the corporate structure in general. I think it's probably more the latter that um, things are sort of, they move at a snail's pace relative to, yeah. to startups. Yeah. My performance ratings were entirely based off of other people's opinions of me and not yeah. actually what I felt I was contributing. And it's like, how do you measure that in a customer service job? I mean, I was doing tech things too, but as my job was to make sure I did the tech things that people wanted me to do. So it was, yeah. it all boiled down to like, how much did these people like me? And so uh, despite how I was feeling every day, I had to put on a face like, Oh, I'm happy. I'm whatever. Yeah. Like, and I just, it just wasn't for me. Yeah. That's frustrating that the uh, kind of relying entirely on somebody else's judgment, as opposed to in the business world, where if you manage to make something that people are willing to give you money for, then that's the judgment that your customers pass on you. Effectively. Yeah. Your only boss is the market. You got it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's that's the boss I prefer. 
So I understand uh, one of uh, your uh, pet peeves is that uh, when you were working from home during the uh, pandemic, you were still expected to be close to the uh, corporate campus. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's right. Which I thought was it's so absurd. Um, the company I worked for actually made national news for uh, having a somewhat silly uh, work at the campus uh, um, policy, which was ironic and funny at the time for everybody involved because, you know, when you have all these people working for you, a lot of them are going to say what they feel, but just behind closed doors. And a lot of my colleagues who had worked there for 15, 20 years are like, yeah, it's not like it used to be. This is sort of ridiculous. I can't believe we can't like all kinds of people wanted to go home and see their families. It was, you know, a very uncertain time when the pand pandemic first hit, nobody knew what was going on. And, yeah. um, some people got to do that for a little bit at first and then pretty much very soon after they cracked down and said, you have to be within 45 minutes of campus, uh, just in case. And it's like, Crazy. in case of what situation does it justify bringing people in during these times? I've never had to be in person <laughs> for anything I've done at this company. Yeah. Crazy stuff. So what was the trigger that finally made you quit? Um, I mean, I kind of knew for a while that I didn't want to do that. I sort of took the job because I had credit card debt coming out of college. That's sort of how I paid my way for li basic living expenses for a lot of it. Um, my financial literacy at that time wasn't the best. Um, and I became, I became financially literate and determined to get myself out of that hole. So the, um, you know, cushy salary and everything basically through all of it at that. And I figured I'd stay two to three years. I ended up staying two and a half. So I was right on the nose. Half a year beforehand, um, I made the plans. I was like, okay, well, pandemic's hit. I guess I can't do backpacking through Southeast Asia or <laughs> living in Europe. So I'll probably just uh, do a road trip across the US and sort of had that planned out and ready to go. And I gave them plenty of notice and uh, left on good terms, but it was definitely something I knew I didn't want to do for the rest of my life. So how did you actually pull the trigger? Was it an email or a letter or was it in person to your boss? Yeah, to my boss, I had conversations with him for months saying like, you know, yeah. I'm not really happy here. He's like, what can make you happy? I'm like, a lot more responsibility. Yeah. He's like, ah, I can't really give you that. And I'm like, okay, well, uh, I don't think I'm growing enough. I'm going to leave. One funny thing about that was uh, that right before I left, some people uh quit be like sort of last minute they gave virtually no notice um because they couldn't go home to see their families and everybody was working remote and they were frustrated from the situation and a lot of people were quitting and <laughs> my boss's boss and um the management on my team actually asked me to stay longer than i had intended to despite me giving six months notice and these other people causing the problem by leaving all of a sudden they said hey can you stay longer and i'm like there is almost nothing you can say to make me stay longer. And they said, what would it take? And I said, uh, how about like, you know, I think I gave something absurd, like a 20% raise or something like that. And they're like, ah, no, I'm like, okay. So <laughs> that's good putting it out there. So to be clear, you had nothing lined up. You didn't have like another job to go to. You didn't have any specific plans for making uh buddy. How, how did that feel? Uh, yeah, I didn't really have anything specific. I had a sort of hot side hustle that I was working on with a couple friends that I still do today. Um, but it's, it wasn't the most lucrative at the time. It's gotten, it's that positive for the most part. Um, but, uh, yeah, really for sources of income, I was just going to live off of some savings that I had. I sold my car and I traveled in another friend's, uh, SUV. We sort of pooled our resources together and did the road trip and, um, did the road trip that way. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it was definitely scary, uh, to sort of take the leap and not know what was going to happen next. I, we had a rough idea of like an itinerary for this road trip for a while. And, um, but even, even during that, I made it a point to say, let's not plan things more than a couple days ahead of time. Like, you know, obviously we need to know where we're going, you know, tomorrow or what we're doing today, or if there's something that we want to do, that's like a longer excursion, like a backpacking trip, which we did a few of, we have to plan that out. But aside from that, let's just wing it. We'll see what happens, go where we want to go. Um, and that was really freeing actually. So, you know, I've heard before the quote that courage is in the absence of fear. It's overcoming it. I think it's very apt. It's like, of course I was scared. Of course there's uncertainty. Um, I, I think that 
embracing that uncertainty and jumping into it, knowing, having enough faith in yourself that you'll make it out okay is sort of the key to doing these things. And so where did you end up going? Started in Utah. Uh, I flew into Salt Lake City. My friend picked me up there. We drove down to southern Utah where there's five national parks, then Grand Canyon. Uh, then I stopped in Phoenix where my parents live, went to Southern California to visit some friends, did some parks around there, worked our way up the coast, Oregon, Washington, went to Montana um, where we attended a wedding, and then down to Wyoming and Yellowstone, and then over to Colorado uh, and finished up in Denver. And how did it feel to have all of that time and all of that space after work? A little uncomfortable, honestly. Yeah, I, I learned something about myself, which is that I need to sort of have some productivity and some things to aim at, like sort of a goal. Otherwise, I feel a little, I don't know, antsy. So I was like a couple weeks into it for sure was probably the worst of it where I was just like, I need to be working. I, I want to make some money. Let's <laughs> let's do this. Like uh, at, towards the end of the trip, we signed up for DoorDash and made some extra money to pay for meals, you know, because we would like to eat out yeah. um, that way. So DoorDashing in Seattle was a, a good way to offset one or two of those meals. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was just very much like I needed something to do. So hiking every day was great because I was like, this is exercise. I'm seeing beautiful things. Um, I did a lot of reading. I did um, not as many like good habits, like trying to meditate as, every day as I would have liked to. But um, just having like boxes to check off is something that I guess makes me feel really good. And I, I learned that about myself as a person is I can't really sit idly like I used to when I was like in high school and I would just play video games all the time and I was totally satisfied with that. And tell me more about the side <laughs> project. You had a side project going before you quit work. Did you carry on with that while you were on your road trip? Yeah, a little bit. Um, the side projects of selling Bitcoin ATMs. So uh, me and a couple of friends from college uh, got together and I, my friend basically fell into a deal where he was able to get a, a bunch of these ATMs placed in smoke shops because he knew the guy who owned the ATM company and knew the guy who owned the smoke shop or was a manager of the smoke shop company, sort of put it together and got a nice commission and said, hey, Bart, will you help me build a company around this so we can continue doing this? And I said, yeah. And so I formed a basic LLC uh, partnership with the two of them. Um, we all have different skill sets that work together, but I handled a lot of the um, legal and accounting and stuff like that. So what does your life look like right now? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I never really stopped traveling, although it has been less intentional uh, since the end of the road trip. Um, like I said, I finished up in Denver, uh, rented a car, drove to Phoenix, um, stayed with my parents for a little bit, went to Miami for a week to check out if I wanted to live there, met some friends there. Um, and then I flew to Chicago a couple weeks ago. Stayed with some friends there, drove up to Madison where I used to live, and now I'm living in my college town, actually, Champaign, Illinois, uh, for the time being, where I'm crashing with a friend um, until I leave to Los Angeles next week. Fantastic. Well, just a couple of final questions about, first of all, how has quitting your job changed how you think about meaning in your life? Well, certainly the thing about meaningful work being important um, was something that I had thought about during the beginning of the trip. And I think about a lot today, um, the work that I did at the tech company, I felt mostly was meaningful, not because of the work itself, but because of the goal I had, which was sort of digging myself out of this financial hole, um, and saving up money to do something that I really wanted to do. Uh, but outside of that, um, it didn't check any other boxes. I, the work I was doing wasn't super compelling. So now I'm working on things that I, um, actually think are going to make a difference. So, you know, the Bitcoin ATM thing is also a sort of means to an end. It's a great way to make residual income, passive income, which I think is helpful for just enabling me to do work on other things that I find enjoyable that aren't necessarily that lucrative right away. But um, my friend here, while I've, while I've been uh, crashing at his house, I'm sort of um, paying my way with uh, random labor. I helped set up some circuitry for an uh, automated hydroponic system the other day. Um, was throwing together some more components for the hydroponics today. Um, I think that's really meaningful work, growing food sustainably. That's probably the most meaningful thing I can think of. I've been learning Web3 development, um, which I am really excited about. I think that could be a huge technology, um, which would also allow me to have a skill that I can do like sort of remotely and um, make money without a boss, which is a big, big plus for me. So, um, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I think I really like the way that Viktor Frankl puts it. If you've ever heard of the book, um, Man's Search for Meaning, he says essentially um, you can get through anything if you have the right kind of meaning. And um, and that's sort of how I think about life is that if I don't have something meaningful to work towards, it's less satisfying and that's an inherently human condition. So thinking back to the time that you were working for the tech company, what would you say to your former self if you could go back in time? I think the best time to go back in time would be before I accepted it. I probably would have said <laughs> search a little longer. Yeah. I know you're anxious. I know you are not so confident that your skills are going to be lucrative immediately outside of college. I majored in physics with a, a bachelor's, which is like pretty much everybody needs like a PhD <laughs> if yeah. you're going to do actual physics work. So I would have, I would have just probably told myself before accepting the position, like go look for a startup. You don't need money that quickly. Um, I know you're in debt. You need to get out of it for sure, but, you know, maybe choose a middle ground where things are moving faster and the team is smaller and you can make more of an impact than um, big corporate bureaucracy. But part of the reason I don't regret it now is I've learned that about myself is I don't want to work for big tech companies anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll never make the same mistake twice. Well, listeners, if you'd like to connect with Bart, he's on Twitter at a busy hippie. Um, Bart, thank you so much for joining me on the Quit Work Podcast. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Thanks for listening to the Quit Work Podcast. I love talking to people who have taken the bold step of quitting their job to start living their true life. Join me for a fresh conversation every week. Subscribe to the podcast or the YouTube channel at quitworkproject.com. And if you have any comments on this episode, or if you'd like to tell your own quit work story, I'd love to hear from you. Contact me at quitworkproject.com or on Twitter or Instagram at quitworkproject. I hope you too find your way to quitting work and living your true life.